Welcome to the Civilization Side tutorial for this series, where I found the Start Game button finally at the third video in. This is the main overworld heads up display for Thea. I've already had my wandering party explore out a bit to remove the fog from some area around the starting town. Please note that I am playing this on a PC. I know there's a version for the Nintendo Switch, but as I don't own a Switch, I can't comment on any UI differences. Sorry. Starting in the top left, we have the pause symbol. This brings up the main game menu. The two buttons save and load are grayed out in my sample here, because I turned off the saves option in the difficulty menu. If you don't know what the difficulty menu is, feel free to view the previous video in this series. Who knows, your view might be the one that finally pushes it to the triple digits. The question mark in the bottom left brings up a help menu. Quite useful for a lot of the things you may wish to brush up on, and indeed I'll be using it to assist with my descriptions in this video. Next to the menu symbol in the top left is the day-night cycle. Every time the turn counter hits a multiple of three, the time will advance one notch. I'll bring up the help menu here for a visual assist. Thea has six time brackets. Morning, noon, afternoon, evening, midnight, and what I'll call third shift. The day-night cycle affects enemy aggressiveness, the visible radius around your town and adventuring parties, and a few other special cases. Morning, noon, and afternoon are considered fully daytime with maximum view range and minimum enemy hatred. Evening and third shift are about half and half, and midnight is maximum aggro and your view radius shrinks to nothing, god perks and town buildings notwithstanding. Just above the help menu in the bottom left is where you will see alerts to any bad situations your characters are in. I can make one appear real fast by turning off all fuel sources in my town. And there's the icon telling me that my town has run out of fuel. How narratively convenient. There are six possible icons that you can see down here. Two different weight-related warnings, two different warnings about your food situation, one alert for running out of fuel, and one to tell you that someone might be about to die. I'd say that the icons with the red background are the more critical ones, but that's 86% of them. Basically, if there's an alert down here, you should probably attend to it immediately. In the top right here, you will see turn start notifications. As in, every time a turn starts, anything that happened will be listed in this area. You can mouse over the icons to get a synopsis of what it means, or you can click on it directly to get a full report. The picture in the top right is your chosen god. Clicking on it will show you a menu with some lovingly crafted artwork. On the right is the active bonuses for the god you have chosen, and on the left is three tabs showing your current status on the game's three possible paths to victory, and a fourth tab showing a recap of what difficulty options you chose for this run. Below the deity piction is a rough snapshot of the selected group's status. Note that group can mean wandering party or the town itself. In both cases, you will see a report on the number of people in the party and the remaining turns worth of food and fuel they have. For wandering parties, you'll also get info on how much movement they have left this turn and their group carrying capacity. Below that is two meters, one showing the progress towards your next point of research, and one is your experience meter. Research is simple. Every time the meter fills, you get one point, and I'll show you how to spend that point in a sec. Experience is very different in this game than you may be used to. Characters in Thea the Awakening do not have traditional character levels. They are nothing more than a collection of skills. Each time this meter fills, every single character you have will increase a single attribute, and that increase will either be by one or two points. Also, every time either of these meters fills, the amount needed to fill it again will go up. This does mean that the longer a character is with you, the more valuable he or she is. Not that dragons or giants that join you in the hyper late game are pushovers, mind you. I'll go over characters and leveling more next video. And as for research, there are six buttons down here in the bottom right. The topmost is your research, with a number under it showing how many unspent points you have. 
Clicking on the button will bring up the research menu, which has three tabs, gathering, crafting, and construction. To be able to get to any specific research item, you first have to research the previous items in its respective tree. And the number of research points needed to unlock any given item is shown right below its icon. Also, you'll notice the items that are on the far outside of the tree are hidden behind question marks. The crafting tab I'm going to hold off on until the video about combat, and the construction tab I'll save for the video on towns and parties. When it comes to the gathering tab, the materials behind the question marks aren't just for spoiler purposes. I mean, after one long game, you'll know what all of them are anyway. But I'll bring up why the hidden ones are important in a bit. Also, semi-spoiler alert, but here's the screenshot of the completed tree in 3, 2, 1, there you go. The official image from the MUHA website. They've also changed what the piece of amber looks like since that picture was taken, so let me slide that in here. Alright, and now, back to the game. The next button down is the game log. Here you'll find a record of all the major stories that are progressing in the game, in case you've forgotten them. Not all the events will go here. Many repeatable random events and encounters that have nothing to do with the game's narrative won't show up. Which is a good thing too, as I'd hate to read 30 different log entries about a collapsing house. Next button is the Go to Settlement button. This button will center the screen on your town and bring up the village overview. It's exactly the same as if you were to click on the town and pick the magnifying glass. Below Go to Settlement is the Next Group button. Clicking this will select one of your parties, and clicking it again will cause it to rotate between any other parties. Note that the game considers the town to be an active party, and even if you have zero people in it, it still counts. Really, the town is just a party with two extra options anyway, but I'll go over that in the Towns and Parties video. On the bottom left of the button field is the Show Resources button. This is a toggle that causes the main game screen to change between showing resource deposits per hex and showing basically everything else. Note here that one of the resources is grayed out. This means that the resource is present, but I haven't unlocked the research to actually harvest it yet. It is guaranteed that your town will always start with at least one fuel source and one food source in range to harvest, but there is no upper limit to the number of resources that your town might end up with. Also, and this is important, remember when I said those question mark hidden resources weren't just for spoiler purposes? Any resource that is still covered by a question mark, as in any that you have not yet unlocked the prior resource to, will not show up on the map. There could be ancient wood right under my town for all I know, but until I at least research elven wood, I have no way of telling. And if you think that there's no way a powerful endgame resource would be right at your village, well, 98% of the time, you'd be right. But every so rarely, you'll luck out and have something super useful that you can harvest from within the safety of your walls. I mean, when you get around to building walls. The button in the very bottom right is the End Turn button. When you click it, the game will check if any of your near-death people die, enemy groups will move around, resources you're harvesting will get added to your stockpile, random events may fire, all the things that you'd expect to happen at the end of a turn in any game ever. And the last thing to show on the overworld map is event activation. Events can be activated by approaching an event trigger, like a hostile, but they can also trigger randomly for every single hex you walk on. The odds of an event happening randomly on any given hex is fairly low, but you'll be doing a lot of walking in Thea and it's bound to occur sometimes. When an event triggers, you'll be taken to a screen like this. A splash screen with a hand-drawn picture on the left, the text of the event on the top right, and the various options you have being under said text. You'll notice in this event I have some choices in black font and some in blue. Black font means a choice that I always have available. What a blue fonted option means is that it is only available due to some validity check the game has performed. Sometimes it'll be dependent on you having done some part of another quest, or your chosen god. Sometimes it'll be if your group has a specific class in it, or a specific race, 
or one or more characters with a specific skill up to a specific level. Lots of possibilities is what I'm saying. Blue fonted options are not necessarily the better choice, but if you met the criteria to enable them, you should definitely consider them. I mean, unless you're playing a god whose preferred method of handling encounters is battle axe diplomacy. Any option that has a picture of skulls to the left of it has a very high chance of you entering a challenge. What type of challenge that will be should always show up at the end of the selected option in brackets just so that you aren't surprised at what you get yourself into. The number and color of the skulls determine roughly how difficult the challenge will be, although given how your group is made up and what type of challenge you're entering, there is a rather high variance in how easy it will actually end up. Really, it just comes down to game experience to whether or not you know what you should do. Also, if you're the one initiating the encounter, you'll usually have some form of not-right-now choice which just exits the event. But if something walks up to you, then there's a good chance you're going to have to deal with it, like, now. And if it's a hostile group, there's a good chance that you'll have fewer options than if you engage them. So when dealing with wandering encounters, it's usually better to be the initiator. Lastly, all of the game's storylines, and a good chunk of the random events, are all voiced by a narrator. Just one guy though, and he voices everything. Random text, house demon, ancient dragon, orc matriarch, all him. It all comes across a lot like a guy with his grandkids on his knees telling them all a bedtime story. And I love it. And that is the overworld and main UI of Thea. I keep talking about characters and their skills, so next video will be dedicated to the characters and their skills. Till then.